Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Greg and Arif for the opportunity. Today I'll be discussing vasomotor rhinitis and uh, posterior nasal uh, nerve ablation. Um, and just really reflecting on my own training, this is a topic that I think really has received very little attention. However, in practice, it's something that I appreciate to be quite common and impactful for patients. And uh, I hope this talk will be informative to you all. So we'll begin by uh, reviewing the presentation and the evaluation of uh, non-allergic and vasomotor or idiopathic rhinitis. Uh, and next we'll delve into the pathophysiology of vasomotor rhinitis. And finally, the, the fun part, uh, we'll explore the um, various treatment options available for patients with uh, medically uh, refractory and bothersome symptoms. So I know it comes to, as no surprise to, to many of us that non-allergic uh, rhinitis is a very prevalent condition affecting approximately 30 million Americans. And uh, it's believed that the incidence uh, increases with age, uh, most commonly presenting within uh, the third and the sixth decades of life. So it's a condition characterized by chronic nasal congestion, obstruction, rhinorrhea, despite a negative allergen test, although um, more recent recommendations uh, from the allergy literature uh, suggest that the diagnosis really can be made on history alone. Uh, and unlike seasonal allergic rhinitis, patients with non-allergic rhinitis tend to experience uh, perennial symptoms. And about a fifth of these patients uh, do not respond to medical therapy and really come to us eager for some relief. So vasomotor rhinitis is one of the most common cause of uh, non-allergic rhinitis, and it's considered to be a diagnosis of exclusion and accounts for 50% of non-allergic rhinitis patients overall. And due to the lack of, a, of specific diagnostic tests, again, a comprehensive uh, history really is uh, crucial. So... I guess sometimes uh, while evaluating these patients, I feel like it's a trip down uh, memory lane to medical school where we're talking about the social and the medical histories. Um, and I personally find these patients uh, to be kind of a nice change of pace in a complex uh, rhinology practice. A detailed history uh, with attention uh, to medications and potential triggers such as um, environmental changes, cold or dry air, um, smoke, uh, perfume exposure, um, stress, or exercise uh, is really essential. And patient-reported outcome measures such as um, the nose questionnaire or the SNOT-22 uh, alongside nasal endoscopy really can corroborate uh, the patient's history and aid in the diagnosis. Allergy testing and uh, a CT of the sinuses can be pursued um, really to rule out other pathologies but um, aren't always necessary. So pathophysiologically, vasomotor rhinitis is thought to involve uh, upregulation of uh, neuropeptide signaling and autonomic uh, dysregulation as well as localized inflammation. And more specifically, the imbalance uh, between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic inputs uh, to the nasal mucosa, uh, which results in um, dysregulation of the mucosal vascular tone, uh, glandular secretions, which accounts for the bothersome symptoms our patients describe. So treatment really starts with uh, patient education uh, and avoidance. Um, pharmacologic treatments include ipratropium bromide uh, for vasomotor rhinitis. And it's a nice medication for patients uh, with non-allergic rhinitis uh, with rhinorrhea as the main symptom and really is one of the few medications in our armamentarium um, that really works on demand for patients, uh, which is really nice. In addition, uh, studies have shown that it can be a helpful uh, predictor of success with in-office posterior nasal nerve ablation with responders uh, demonstrating about an 85% uh, success rate, uh, while about a third of non-responders uh, improving. So it's important to note that uh, a substantial proportion uh, of patients may have mixed or overlapping causes. Uh, and you may consider topical antihistamines for allergic causes or nasal steroids for um, signs of inflammation and nasal saline irrigations for overall sinus health. So in terms of uh, procedural management, um, techniques such as cryoablation, uh, radiofrequency treatment, and surgical ablation target the autonomic dysfunction by uh, disrupting signal transduction at various points. Um, here you can see the Vidian nerve. Um, oh, let me grab this. Uh, you see the video nerve here with the arrow. Here, let's see if we can get this going. 
All good. Um, we, got the, we got the pointer. So video nerves coming out here, um, and then the more distal branches innervating uh, the, the mucosa over the lateral nasal wall. <clears throat> These interventions, including uh, cryoablation and uh, RF uh, treatments, are, are really helpful treatment options for patients uh, who are presenting after being treated uh, with several sprays and, and really looking to us uh, for another option uh, beyond what they may have been prescribed uh, by their PCP or allergists, and they're often really enthusiastic to know that there's more treatment options that are available to them. So in terms of cryoablation, Clarifix uh, was approved for posterior nasal nerve ablation in 2017. This is a, an all-in-one device, meaning that there's no console. It uses a, a canister uh, of nitrous oxide, which holds about one minute of treatment and uh, delivers localized freezing to the posterior nasal tissues um, at the distal end, which has this balloon. So the balloon freezes um, the nerve to negative 60 degrees Celsius while sparing the blood vessels and um, let's take a look at a video. So this is the right nasal cavity, which has been um, topicalized um, and injected with local. Um, there's a variety of ways to do this. Um, and here we are applying the, uh, the device, sliding it into that posterior attachment of the middle turbinate area to the lateral nasal wall um, and trying to apply the uh, balloon uh, inferiorly as well for the cryoablation. Uh, the device is activated for about uh, 30 seconds, um, and the patient is then instructed to breathe uh, through the nose uh, to thaw the device and kind of defrost it uh, so that it could be more easily and atraumatically released. Um, and you can see after treatment, um, there's some blanching which shows uh, good effect. This is a nice uh, 2023 uh, systematic review, which included uh, eight studies evaluating 472 patients. And the data showed a significant reduction uh, in scores from um, baseline for post-treatment across all of the outcome measures um, and all of the time intervals. So no major adverse events uh, were identified, although uh, we know from prior studies that about a third of these patients can experience what's called a high ice cream headache. Uh, which can be mitigated in a variety of ways, including pre-medication. And gabapentin has actually also been described to, to mitigate some of those symptoms, but I don't personally do that. It's worth noting that there are um, studies showing two-year durability of this treatment, which has been really nice to see as well. The Ryanair device is another option. This was approved in 2019, and it utilizes a, a console shown here on the top right to deliver uh, radio frequency energy to the posterior nasal nerve. It's recommended that the device be used at several sites uh, in the posterior nasal cavity, shown here, um, and along the inferior turbinate. And it delivers energy over about 12 seconds to a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius uh, to a depth of about 3 uh, millimeters. So this is. Uh, the right nasal cavity, uh, you can see that the device is being slid into the middle meatus. It has a, a conductive gel applied to the tip of it. A little bit of a tight, narrow space, so uh, outfracturing the inferior turbinate. The end of the instrument is applied into that same uh, attachment area of the middle turbinate. Um, and here, uh, the device is actually being applied to the posterior aspect of the attachment of the middle turbinate, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, shortly. So uh, this is a systematic review published just this year um, of five studies uh, with a total of 284 participants. And the data similarly showed a significant reduction in scores post-treatment at all time intervals. And it's worth noting that there was a less than 10% rate of adverse events, um, which were mostly minor, indicating a really favorable safety profile. And also just this year, Takashima and colleagues published a, a randomized controlled trial demonstrating two-year post-treatment efficacy as well. So this is a nice anatomic study, and I just wanted to, to mention this, uh, because as we learn more about the distribution of the posterior nasal nerve, um, we start to think about the, the wider distribution than potentially uh, earlier suspected. This study confirms that uh, what well, many of us who perform this procedure have noticed, that there's a broad uh, treatment area, often uh, extending inferiorly. Um, this is the uh, attachment of the inferior turbinate nasal floor here. Um, so extending inferiorly and posteriorly as well towards the sphenoid face and the eustachian tube in this area. 
Um, and treating these areas may provide some added benefit to the patient. Uh, one recent innovation that I think represents a, a new phase in treatment of the posterior nasal nerve and its broad distribution is the Neuromark device, which was approved um, in 2021. And this device uh, delivers low power radio frequency at 20 different sites of treatment with uh, real time impedance feedback. And this is what the device looks like uh, with several mm -hmm. elastic leaflets distal to a, to a malleable shaft that allows for placement posteriorly to address a wide area uh, with less need for direct uh, visualization. And this is the, the left nasal cavity. This is the device being introduced um, and advanced posteriorly. The uh, elastic uh, basket is then deployed and the electrodes deliver several micro lesions to the posterior nasal nerve uh, distribution. And Dr. Davis was kind enough to share several pearls in the use of this device uh, listed on the left side of the screen, which includes particular attention to the relationship of the device to the middle turbinate and the middle meatus. I did want to mention that the evidence from systematic reviews and meta-analyses indicate that the Clarifix and the Ryanair devices provide similar outcomes in improving nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, itching, and sneezing with no single device significantly outperforming others um, with an odds ratio close to one. And lastly, for patients with uh, persistent uh, and refractory symptoms uh, to in-office ablation, surgical treatment of the posterior nasal nerve uh, is an option. Um, here we are on the left side, elevating mucosal flaps after we've performed a maxillary entrostomy and uh, really elevating the um, kind of medial aspect of the um, orbital process of the, the mucosa overlying the orbital process of the palatine bone. You can see some of the fibers emanating into the, to the mucosa there. We're extending the neurolysis inferiorly under the attachment of the inferior turbinate um, to capture those fibers as well. Um, we like to elevate the maxillary mucosa as well for um, the end of the procedure and the closure. We, I do perform an SPA ligation for this procedure uh, as some of the nerve fibers tend to track along the sphenopalatine artery and it really helps to visualize more posteriorly to capture some of those fibers that we discussed on the previous slide. So um, patients do quite well from this procedure with minimal post-operative side effects and we're currently reviewing our own series at the University of Washington to better understand some of these outcomes. So in summary, based on the available evidence, all three devices likely offer uh, similar and durable outcomes, and the choice should really be based on the provider's familiarity and confidence with the device. Screening patients for candidacy for procedures in the office is crucial, and um, Atrovent really can play a, a helpful role in decision-making, patient counseling. And there's really exciting and emerging evidence uh, on the distribution of the parasympathetic fibers, suggesting a more diffuse pattern than was previously thought. And newer devices have really adapted to this. Um, and for treatment failures, alternative uh, procedures like the SP3 offer uh, additional treatment options for patients uh, suffering um, from rhinitis symptoms and its profound impact on quality of life. That's it. Thanks very much. Which procedure do you use now? Um, I present all of the options to the patient. The ones that we have available at our institution are the, the Clarifix and the Ryanair. And I have the patients kind of uh, tell me what they would prefer. Um, I give them the kind of the risks and the benefits of both and what patients have described to me as some of the common side effects. And I would say most patients, I, I most commonly probably perform the Ryanair procedure. And when they ask you how long will it last? <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Which they always do. Yeah, you know, um, I think um, the data is very strong for two years at least. I think that that's what I tell patients. Um, we don't have studies beyond the two year mark, but I'm sure those will be, be um, coming. But um, I was really happy to see, you know, the cryoablation. Based on the mechanism, I was always kind of wondering, you know, is this a long term fix or is this a short term kind of band aid? And it does appear to have some durability, which is great. Thank you. Yeah. So if a patient does not respond to Atrovent, do you just take that as an indicator that they might not respond well, or do you just not offer the procedure to them at all? 
I think the former, yeah. So um, I still offer it. You know, the the procedure is indicated as as you know for allergic rhinitis and non-allergic rhinitis, both. The success rate is higher uh, based on the literature for um, non-allergic rhinitis. So I do counsel the patients that the likelihood of their benefit is probably a bit higher if they did respond, but I will offer it to them if they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Jafari, do you have any information on using SP3 as second line after those ablative procedures, or do you offer that as just an alternative? Yeah, it's a great question. The um, I I tend to offer the SP3 after the patient has failed an in-office procedure. There are some other circumstances, such as if the patient needs sinus surgery for another reason as well, that uh, you know that may be a better option for them up front. But I would say the vast majority of times, I, I like to go with the least invasive route. But uh, yeah, yeah. How's uh, getting prior off? Because you know with diagnosis. <laughs> Yeah, so um, it depends, uh, you know, like many things we do, it depends on our on the patient's insurance and the coverage. And so various different carriers will have different policies. And so we really collaborate with uh, the our kind of compliance team and our authorization team to help us uh, get the authorization for the patients. And uh, there's other resources that each individual company has to help guide through that process. And so um, they've been helpful as well. But it is it is an ongoing challenge, as um, Dr. Davis and others had mentioned, there are new codes. and so. Um, hopefully it'll be a little bit more streamlined in the future. <laughs>